This episode is sponsored by Brilliant. SpaceX Starship Updates and Zubrin talks Starship facts with Elon Musk. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It? And as always, there has been a lot going on in the space industry lately, so let's dive right in. Starship Updates Progress in Boca Chica, Texas, where SpaceX is right now building their second and third generation prototypes of their fully reusable Starship is really hard to track right now. SpaceX is ramping up their production more and more and so milestones are basically achieved on a daily basis. I'll try to sum it up as good as possible for you though. First of all, I want to wish Mary aka Boca Chica Gal a wonderful holiday. Relax and enjoy the time away from Starship construction. The last pictures she took for us before she left were very promising. Here you can see her latest drive-by. A very nice way of showing overall progress of both the launch site and the shipyard. The place is buzzing with activity and SpaceX is keen on getting the Starships out to the launch pad. My guess is that Elon can't wait for the day to come probably very similar to how we look forward to it. No matter what happens on the launch, it will be yet another step towards the most profound change the space industry has had in the last 60 years. And SpaceX is fleshing out the stack sitting on the jig right now. This picture is the kind of image we're going to see a lot more of in the near future. These external systems are an indicator for SpaceX starting work on vital systems integration. After all, an empty hull won't fly and so a lot of plumbing, electronics and avionics will have to be installed in the coming weeks. So bear with me on this one, we're getting technical here. If you have any questions after the episode, seek the comment section. This is the thrust section. If you peek through this hole, you can clearly see a thrust structure. This is needed to stabilize the engine bay inside the hull because it applies a lot of thrust to the hull at liftoff. If that is correct though, this part needs to be flipped like so. Now these controllers here can also be found on Mark 1, the older Starship version. They were in a very different location though. They were inside the engine bay. They're pressure regulators of some sort, either for hydraulics or the autogenous pressure system. If they are for hydraulics, they would be needed for both the fins and the legs. If they are for the legs, we might, just might, see a three-leg design on serial number 1 returning. Musk said on Twitter that Starships will not need RCS thrusters to do the flip maneuver before landing. Pre-serial number 1 there was a lot of talk regarding center of mass and that a flip maneuver would be really hard to do. Now Musk openly states that there won't even be RCS thrusters needed. Only flaps and gimbal engines. Last year Musk even spoke of hot gas thrusters needed for the flip which produce much more thrust. One of the reasons surely must be that the center of mass problem has been reduced header tanks as up as possible and further weight reduction on the bottom. This would speak in favor of a three-leg design. Did SpaceX have a breakthrough? We'll have to wait and see. Another use for the pressure regulators would be autogenous pressurization. If you look closely at the parts, you will notice that on one of them most of the caps are red and on the other one most are blue. This could be for oxygen and methane backflow. It's all speculation though. I prepared a little overview for you, so you get a better idea of what parts of Starship Serial No. 1 are done so far. Do not kill me in the comments if you think one of the parts needs to go somewhere else, it's hard to get right at the moment. So first of all, thanks go out to Reddit user File097, I hope I didn't butcher that name too hard, for an awesome work on some technical drawings of Starship Mark 1 and Serial No. 1. Show some love for him in the comments and give him an upvote on his reddit post if you can, link will be in the description. Let's take a look at Mark 1 again. Even though similar on the outside, a lot of the construction has changed already. The old header tank construction, hastily engineered by SpaceX late last year as they found out that the original design with the header tanks inside the main propellant tanks would not work due to the center of mass being too low, is already gone. Ring manufacturing has changed vastly and the general build quality did a huge step forward. In comparison, this is serial number 1. Technically, the second generation Starship already and as you can see in the side-by-side -side view, there are quite a few internal differences already. Don't pay too much attention to the fins, they're from Mark 1 and Musk already said that the new Starship will get new fins, so they might look different. Here you can see the new header tank design and what becomes very well apparent is how much the new design pulls the tanks into the top. 
They're pretty much as high as possible up there, giving the Starship some very much needed counterweight to fight the center of mass problem. Musk has already confirmed that the raceways on the sides will be used again for fuel lines and for autogenous pressure feeding from the engines. For those who do not know, Starship will keep the pressure inside the tanks constant in flight by feeding half-burned propellant back into the tanks. This gets rid of the need to carry gas specifically for pressurization and in return saves weight. So on the finished build, the piping except for what's going on in the nose should look rather similar to Mark 1's design. Now let's concentrate on serial number 1 and see what parts of the Starship are already finished. We already have the finished nose cap, including the header tanks. The new header tank sphere has recently been finished and also the cone-shaped top tank has already been spotted. So we can put a check mark on that. We can also put a check mark on the midsection of the propellant tanks. The common bulkhead has already been installed in two parts. First the outer ring and then the inner downcomer with just a small hole in it for the feeder pipe that will lead from the oxygen tank through the methane tank down to the engines. And we have the top dome in it too. This already completes the oxygen tank which finishes half of the tank structure. On we go with the bottom section. This is where the engines, legs and lots of plumbing will be in the end. A very important part also featuring the thrust structure. On top of that we just need a few more rings which have already been finished as well as you can see here. So basically besides the missing engine skirt on the bottom the whole tank section is already done. I am showing you all this because it is really easy to get lost in all those very similar looking parts and it is an eye opener about how far serial number 1 already is. As SpaceX has switched from ring by ring stacking to segment building the linear progress we were so used to on Mark 1 is gone. This does not mean that progress is slower. Quite the opposite actually. Since SpaceX now is building segments they can be built much faster and without constant crawling into an already finished hull. This leaves more room for building, speeding up construction on the way. Next up we should see the missing cone section being made and the ring segments in between. After that plumbing can begin. I wouldn't be surprised if the segments for serial number 2 then already have the plumbing integrated before stacking to speed up the process even further. One possible reason for so many upper parts still missing could as well still be that SpaceX intends to recycle the old Mark 1 nose cone. Since serial number 1 and 2 are being built parallel, my guess is that serial number 1 will just do the 20 km flight. Serial number 2 then would go for 100 km and maybe orbital. The question now is if a new fairing section is really needed for the 20 km test flight. We'll find out rather soon but I still don't completely rule out the old Mark 1 nose. Why has it not been torn down yet and why is it still sitting there? Zubrin talks Starship facts with Musk. And on we go with Starship information. Robert Zubrin, president of the Mars Society, sat down with Elon Musk during the recent Starship career day in Boca Chica and talked about Starships and future plans. The information gained from that interview was so substantial that I do not want to wait another episode and decided to make this one all about Starship. First of all, Musk said that currently there are a total of about 300 employees working in Boca Chica and that he wants to raise this number within a year to about 3000. This confirms my suggestion that most of the Starship construction will go on in Boca Chica and not in the recently renewed idea of an LA based facility. My guess is that LA might build Raptor engines as Hawthorne would be too small for such a large number and most of the qualified workers are located in California. So Boca Chica will turn into what I predicted a few episodes ago. The pumping heart of the global space industry. The reason for 3000 employees has been stated by Musk as well. Two starships per week. So there will be a mass production facility in Boca Chica. I'll put a link to the episode talking about it from a few weeks ago up as an info card if you want to look into that aspect further. Next he talked about production cost and that shatters every expectation on my side. Musk said that starships will only cost 5 million dollars each. That is insanely cheap and again a strong indicator for an assembly line. Otherwise he can't reduce costs down to such a level. He also said that the first 5 starships will stay on Mars. Makes sense if they are so cheap. They will deliver cargo and a return wouldn't make much sense at all. Another one of my predictions from a few months ago was confirmed as well. No nuclear reactors. 
When Zubrin pointed out that 6 to 10 football fields of solar panels would be needed for a Starship refueling, Musk just replied, fine, that's what we'll do. I'll put another info card for you up as well if you want to look further into how energy supply will be generated for Starship missions. When compared with the Apollo days, Musk said that it's more like a D-Day for Mars. Which I thought was a very, very cool statement. Let's hope the plan works. Musk also confirmed the number of passengers on the first few Starships. It will not carry a hundred people, which was to be expected as a lot of the space will have to be used for cargo. The first crewed ships will carry 20 to 50 people, which sounds like a reasonable number. It still won't be as comfortable as staying at a hotel, but the crew will have far more space inside than for example the Apollo crews had on their trips to the moon. Musk also dismissed the whole mini starship idea brought up by Zubrin in the past. With such cheap costs and such a high production value, SpaceX just won't need to go efficient. It does not matter if starships can't be used for two years when staying on Mars, as they will produce two new ones per week. Just as a side note, keep in mind that producing an SLS takes roughly 20 years. Musk also confirmed that SpaceX intends to go for a 100km hop right after the 20km test flight. If this will be done with a serial number 1 or 2, he didn't say though. Zubrin, by the way, thinks it's very much possible that SpaceX will put an astronaut on Mars before NASA puts the next one on the moon. And Mr. Zubrin, I do think the same. Thank you for the really nice interview, Mr. Zubrin, you rock! This is one of those very rare episodes that's 100% focused on Starship. I do apologize for moving the already announced topic about the ESA Space Debris Office to a future episode. There was just too much information about Starship and a third topic would have possibly not fit into today's episode. I hope you still liked it and if so, hit the thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't done so yet, that helps a lot. People ask me a lot how I get all this content out so fast and how I'm always so well informed. Let me show you at least part of the reason. It all comes down to the right method. Approaching a topic from the right angle is sometimes the only thing you need to change. Brilliant is one of the tools I use on a daily basis. It helps me to learn about stuff I once called my hate classes. At school I always hated math. It was boring, not at all easy to understand and it didn't get my imagination going at all. So when I left school, I stopped learning it. For what I am doing now, math is absolutely necessary though. So I looked for ways to make it interesting, because I didn't want to let it stop me. Brilliant makes that easy with interactive explorations and a mobile app that I can even use on the go. If you're naturally curious, like me, have one of those hate classes yourself and want to get rid of your fear of math, physics or computer science, then get Brilliant Premium and change your approach. Turn it into something you like. Brilliant thought-provoking math, science and computer science content helps guide you to mastery by taking complex concepts and breaking them up into bite-sized, understandable chunks. To get rid of your personal hate classes and at the same time support What About It, go to brilliant.org slash whataboutit and sign up to get access to over 60 interactive courses for free. And if you choose to get the premium subscription, the first 200 to join through the link will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. So improve a bit every day with Brilliant. Links in the description. So this wraps up today's episode of What About It? Did you expect SpaceX to advance so fast with serial number one? And what do you think about two starships per week? As always, tell me in the comments. Welcome to the patron shoutout of episode 73, where I thank my patrons for a stable source of income and some much needed funding for the studio. Without them, what about it would not be possible, so I always take the time to give them a shoutout and show some love for the greatest bunch of people in the world. We chat on the Patreon comments, on the Discord, exchange knowledge and I am proud of having every single one of them on the team. And if you like the show, consider becoming one yourself. And as always, we have new members on the team. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Bill Colston and many others. You rock! Thank you for watching this episode of What About It? And now would be the appropriate time to hit the like button, subscribe and don't forget to hit the bell button to actually receive a notification when I do my uploads. It's a version of support that doesn't cost a penny and it does help me to produce more and better content. And if you do want to spend your money, consider becoming a patron and get insights into the production of What About It and chat with me on the Discord. Or you could buy yourself a new shirt on our merchandise store and look like me. There are plenty original designs available in good quality for a low price made by a space nerd for other space nerds. 
It all helps me to give you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. This one is one of those very rare episodes that's 100% about the, the cats arrived. Yeah, look at that. That's the kitty. The kitty cat. Oh, and a kid's coming too, and I'm not done with recording yet. Hi, Papa. Hi, Helena.